I love this. Faith works. Somebody say faith works. I am such a firm believer in faith in my life in so many ways. Like God has just shown up and shown out and through my faith. Uh, faith is an activator. So I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Are you guys glad to be here this morning? I don't know if I'm ready for it to get cold though, because like I was like, I'm gonna go ahead and wear this leather suit, maybe keep me warm, and I'm still freezing. So we're gonna have to get warm in here. I'm so glad to be here with you guys. This morning we are talking part three of Faith Works. If you're looking for a title for today, I made it. Only believe. Somebody say only believe. Only believe. I love some of the songs we sang today. Just talking about, like, no fear. Don't let fear reside. Where there is faith, do not let the fear overtake it and contaminate it. Last week, Pastor Eli talked about little by little. Faith works little by little, and he talked about, like, the little children. And when he talked about the faith of the little kids, it just makes me think of, is there any little kids in here? Because I might have to monitor what I say. But, um... I can always count on Jacob. I love you, Jacob. I love you. You feel me? Okay. Little kids are just born so pure. And, like, they take what we say as, like, it, we are gods. You know, like, we tell them, you can, like Eli said, jump off the roof or jump off the counter to me. And they just jump. They're just head dive. They trust you completely. But over time, it's like we get burned as kids and then as young adults and adults. And it's like we find out that, like, for a lack of, you know, the kids still being, or for the kids still being in here, like our holiday characters aren't real. And like all these different things aren't real. And we get disappointed and we get defeated and we think, when is the next lie coming up? And can I really believe that God is real? I can't see him. I can see these other things. But yet, little by little, we begin to, to lose hope and trust and faith in people and but as children, when they first come in, they have this pure faith in humanity. And so the, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. I just love that. I love that message so much that he preached last week. It was such an amazing word. But this week, with faith works and only believe, I'm going to jump right into the text. So if you have your Bible, if you would turn with me to Mark chapter 5, verse 21, we're going to start there. If you don't have a Bible we're a church that believes in our Bibles. I know we carry, can carry it on our phone, but we believe the whole Bible. Curtis has his Bible. If you don't have a Bible, would you do me a favor? We want to bless you with one today. We want to get one in your hands. And so today, right after service, Shayla's going to be at the, the First Time Guest Connect prayer table in the back by the inflatable uh, pop-up tent back there. We want to get a Bible in your hand today. Mark chapter 5 verse 21 says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. When he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and throbbed him. Now a certain woman had, now we're jumping to another story here in the middle of the text. It says, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she knew she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, that's Jairus, 
who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tomalin and those who wept and wailed loudly. That's professional mourners. And he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but is sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the daughter of the child and those who were with him, Peter, James, and John, and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kami, which means, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. You know, so often in life, I think sometimes even as followers of Jesus, we see ourselves as those, as those people that come and say, hey, it's already dead. It's already over. You already missed your window. You already missed the opportunity. She's gone. Don't worry the teacher any longer. It's like we disqualify and we discount what God can really do because it's really not over. It doesn't have to be over. We think we don't want to waste the master's time and he has other things. Other people have bigger problems than me. They have bigger issues than me. I don't want to waste him with something so small as such as Eli told on me last week, a parking lot spot. <laughs> but can I tell you that we serve a God who is omnipresent? That means he's everywhere all at the same time. And so like he can tend to my parking lot problems as he tends to your doctor problems. Yeah, yeah. Your health, physician, whatever they've given you, whatever they said about your reports. Like he can tend to my little problems as he tends to your big problems. Or he can tend to my big problems as he tends to your little problems. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. There's nothing too big and nothing too small to ask of him. But it's like we disqualify him instead of believing that he can and that he will intervene in our, in our situation if we believe. It's time that we start to believe again. You see, Jesus can heal all. He can do all. There's not one superpower that he doesn't have. He can do everything. You see, the little girl, she was 12 years old and she had an issue of blood. Her blood had stopped flowing. And then there was this woman, this grown woman who had an issue of blood, whose blood wouldn't stop, would not stop flowing. She had that issue for 12 years. And it's kind of crazy that in the text, the stories are in, in the middle of one another. They're intertwined. But the reality is we serve a God who can, can start a woman's blood on her way. She stops a woman's blood. We serve a God who can stop something and a God who can start something. It depends on whatever your need is. He can do whatever it is you need. There's not one thing that he can't do. If you notice in the text, he says, do not be afraid. Whenever there was such negativity around Jairus starting to discourage him, it's like Jesus said, do not be afraid, only believe. Don't let them get in your ears. If you notice in the text, it says... He put everybody else outside. He put those professional mourners outside. He only wanted the faithers in the room. He didn't want to contaminate what he was about to do. I don't know if in your life, maybe there's some people who don't believe and who are discouraging you in your ear. Maybe you need to set them outside for a little while. Don't let them contaminate what it is you're believing for in your life. Yeah. With the woman with the issue of blood, he tells her that it is her faith that made her well. It was her faith. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. He didn't even know. He didn't have to speak and declare over her. She believed in her heart that if she touched it, she would be healed. And she was. It was her faith that made her well. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for today, God. I thank you, Lord, for sending your Holy Spirit to reside with us, God. Lord, I thank you that you're omnipresent. Lord, that you can be here to comfort me as you're there to comfort somebody else in another country, another nation. God, I thank you. 
for being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Lord. I thank you for writing our story as we give our lives to you, God. Bless this time that we have together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So verse 40, when it talks about putting people outside the room, he only took the faithers with him. He said, you know what? He's, he has trained these people. Peter, James, and John, those were his inner circle. They were in his inner circle, and they know what he can do. And they've seen it. And the parents, they had the faith because that was their baby. They didn't want her to die. So he only allowed them in the room, in the room while he performed this miracle. I just want you to just take a moment and start thinking about maybe who's in the room, who's in a situation, who are you sharing information with that maybe doesn't have the faith that you have. And because of that, it's contaminating your faith and it's making you doubt and it's making you fear. And it's taking away some of the faith that you had. Maybe you need to separate them from this situation and begin to just believe again. Discredit everything they've already said. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is believing something you can't see with your eyes open. Like right now, physical flesh. I can't see certain things happening that I'm believing for. But I want to try something a little bit different today. I've never necessarily seen it done. I tested it on Eli uh, during the week. So I hope this works for you guys too. If you just close your eyes, I want you to imagine something. Close your eyes. I want you to imagine you're on a beach. Doesn't that sound fabulous? You're on a beach, the toes between your sand, and you're watching the ocean waves, and you see a well in the distance, and there is a well in the ocean. Can you see it? Can anybody see it? You see a well? Even though you've never seen this in your life, I want you to imagine now this well is flying over the ocean. It's flying. And you cannot believe your eyes because this well is flying. You can open your eyes for a second. Could you see the well flying? Yes. Faith is seeing something you've never seen before. Sometimes in your imagination, you have to see something happening before it ever happens. I've never before seen in my life a well fly. Maybe jump out and back in, right? But never fly. But I want you to close your eyes one more time. Close your eyes. Don't go to sleep on me, though, because some of you guys are getting too comfy in here, and the, and the fan is blowing just right. <laughs> Imagine that there is a God who loves you. Imagine it. Even though you can't see him, imagine there is a God who loves you. Imagine that he can do anything, and there's nothing he can't do. Now imagine what your problems are. Think of your problems today. What are your problems? What are your struggles today? Now imagine him intervening and fixing that problem in a way that only he can do it. In a miraculous way. As we begin to see it done with our eyes closed, we begin to see it done spiritually. We are acting in faith. You can open your eyes. We're acting in faith. Whenever we begin to see something that is not as though it was, we are acting in faith. I want to share a story today with you, a personal story um, that radically changed my life. And um, I'm just going to dive head first into it because I can't even really. I'm going to have to read too because I'm, I'm going to try to keep myself together. I always promise myself, Sheridan, you're not going to cry today. You know? And I used to blame it on pregnancy, but here we go. Sometimes I cry just because God is so good. I'm not pregnant, by the way. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> So, in October of 2019, I delivered my youngest daughter, Demi. She was a 28-week preemie. Wait, would you grab this table? Go ahead and grab the table. She was a 28-week preemie. That's her and her daddy's hand. If you can imagine how small she is just by her little fingers not even being big enough to hold her daddy's tip of his finger. Doesn't even wrap around. His wedding ring could go around her wrist. If you don't know, men, you're supposed to carry your baby to 40 weeks. Therefore, Demi was three months early. She was two pounds, 10 ounces when she was born. And we were admitted to the hospital for six weeks after her delivery so that she could grow and her lungs continue to develop. 
We got home and a few days later I took her back to the hospital because I knew something was wrong. Actually, I took her and Danny back, who at the time was just 12 months old. In that moment we were admitted to the hospital, both babies, and we were transported to OU Children's Hospital, each their own ambulance. We found out that both babies had caught RSV. At the time I had heard of it, but I really didn't know much about it. Other than approximately 120,000 babies die every year from it. After a few days, both girls were doing great in the hospital. Danny got to go home. And Timmy remained admitted. The next day, we had hoped that Demi, too, would get, get to go home. A few hours into the next day, I felt like God told me to look at the monitors. And when I looked, being a NICU mom and having babies in the hospital for weeks at a time, you know what the monitor numbers are supposed to read and what they're supposed to say. And in that moment, I knew my baby was dying, laying on my chest. Although the monitors weren't alarming like normal hospital monitors would, in that moment I pulled the code blue alarm that sat on the wall. A nurse paged in asking if everything was okay and I demanded, I said, do not come in here and get the doctor now. Not knowing exactly what the cord on the wall would do when pulled, many doctors and nurses came running to my room. At one point there were over 30 people in the room, in the hallway, and waiting to help assist Demi. Immediately they grabbed her from my arms, put her on the bed, and began CPR. I began to have what felt like a foreshadowing of this day, today. I knew I believed in God and that in fact he is a miracle worker. I felt like quickly in a moment of emergency, I had peace. And I also had the faith to believe that I needed to take pictures and video because one day I would share her death story as a life story. So today I share the story of how God saved my baby after several deaths in 24 hours.
In these moments of taking the video and really the whole time I was there, I didn't have the words to pray. I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the emotional energy and even just physical energy. I didn't have the words to pray. I, I wasn't even praying in the Holy Spirit. I just felt like I just sat there and just believed. I'm like, God, you're going to do it. That's it. Like, you don't, like, that's it. There's no other, like, I ain't looking any other way. You're going to do it. And it's like, I was just completely exhausted. I, seven weeks prior, just giving birth to this little bitty baby. In an emergency C-section where my baby would be placed on life support immediately after delivery. Take it away from me, living on a different floor of the hospital than I would. She was hospitalized for 47 days and I would come home for six days and be with her. And I was readmitted. She was readmitted for what would be the longest 34 days of my life. I was exhausted, but I still believed. I still believed. I've seen God do miracles. I've seen him do it in other people. I've seen him do it for me, but never at the expense of the life of my child. I still had faith. Regardless of what the doctors were saying and the chaos in the room where they needed the peace and quiet because they needed to think of what they had learned in med school, what they had learned, what, what is these formulas, what can I do to keep this baby alive? But I had faith. Even in moments when I couldn't pray, I had faith. Maybe you're in a situation in your life right now where you're tired and you're like, I don't even... Like, I'm just too tired. I'm too tired to listen to worship music. I'm too tired to go to church. I'm too tired to pray. I'm just too tired. Can I challenge you that even in the moments of you being tired, don't stop believing? Do not stop believing. Do not be afraid of your situation. But believe. Just believe. In those moments when I was in the hospital, I would send out texts, and, and I'm very transparent with my life, and I would even put it on Facebook, pray now. I would send my family 911. I would just send the numbers, 911. And they would know exactly what to do. You need people around you that even when you can't pray, they got you. We have to believe. Begin to see the outcome in your mind of what you believe. If God was in it, what could really happen? The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 26 through 28, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who believe, to love, for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is praying for you. Even when you can't pray, he is making intercession for you. It goes on to say in verse 34 that Christ sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. So the Holy Spirit is praying for you. Jesus is praying for you. And they are praying things as the will of God would have it be. And so like even whenever you don't have the energy and you're tired and your emotions are just drained, know that when you're a child of God, He is making intercession for you. All you have to do is believe. What does intercession mean? That's something like I feel like I hear a lot. Is What does intercession even mean? Intercession means that he is praying or speaking on behalf of you and your situation. But we must have the faith. Faith works through love, the Bible tells us. Faith is seeing things that you have not seen. I can remember 20 years ago, 
I could see myself being a mom as I'd walk around with kids who are one year younger than me on my hip. You know, I'd have to stick a ray out there because I didn't have no hips. But I could see myself being a mother. And I loved it and I was so excited about it. I could just see it. At 15 years old, I saw myself on my wedding day and I started creating a Pinterest board and I could see myself finding a man that I would love forever. I could see it. I didn't know who he was. And 15 years ago, I didn't like this guy. You know, he got on my nerves. But I could see myself on my wedding day. I could see myself getting married. At 17, I could see myself attending Oklahoma State University. I didn't know how I would get there. Come on, Ali. Even though yesterday's loss was awful, we still beat Texas, OU fans. Um, I could see myself attending Oklahoma State University and having so much fun there, which I did. All the things. It was so fun. But I could see foreshadowings of things. In, in your life, you can probably see a foreshadowing of things. You have, you believe in things. A lot of times I think, you know, even non-believers, non-followers of Jesus, they can see things and they foreshadow things, but they don't realize what they're actually doing is they're having faith in something. It just might not be God, but they are having faith in something, for something. We often hear the term of walk by faith. Faith without works is dead. If you are stepping, if you are not stepping out into the unknown, into the unsure, you're not walking by faith. You're just chilling. You're just chilling. And I don't even know if it's chilling by faith. You're just chilling. You're not doing nothing. But when you close your eyes, faith is closing your eyes and taking that next step, believing that that next step in the staircase is actually there and you're not walking off of a cliff. That is faith. In the U.S., our currency is the U.S. dollar. In Mexico, it's the peso. In Europe, it's the euro. And in Christ, it's faith. Faith is our currency. The only thing that moves the heart of God is faith. That is our currency. Faith does not look at the circumstances. Faith looks at God and says, I know you can and I believe you will. Luke 21 verse 1 through 4 says, And he looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood she had. Faith in this verse, it talks about rich putting in their excess and things like that. It's not a sacrifice moment. It's just a generosity moment. It's not a sacrifice. It's not like, hey, I'm believing in God to do some crazy miracle because I'm putting in crazy faith in my offering or my gift. For better understanding because we don't really understand what mites are it's a currency there but mites think of two pennies this lady put two pennies into the the tithes and offerings this sunday it's not much to us right but at the same time she put in all she had if you play poker she went all in she went all in with what she had she has nothing else to lose but she has everything to gain. And when she begins to trust in God, God says, you know what? I see your sacrifice. I see your belief in me. And now I'm going to meet you right where you are and I'm going to provide. I know Eli and I, we're, we're in unity over faith. And we're, we stand in unity over our giving. You know, I don't want to just give out of my excess. I want to depend on God. But that's dangerous. Because it's uncomfortable. Honestly, I don't like it. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, are you sure that you, that he asked us to give all of our savings and our checking account, both accounts. When he asked us to do that twice, I was like, are you sure? Like, I'm not sure if you're sure. You know, like, you're God. I know you're God, but, like, for real? But the reality is, would we trust him if he really called us to do that? Would we really trust him? Would we be in unity? Or do we only want to give our excess? Is your faith in your job and who's writing your paycheck? Is your faith in your husband who gives you an allowance or gives you money to spend? Is your faith in friends and your parents? Who is your faith in? God provided for us when he called us to do something and we stepped out in faith. He provided for us. Anytime we step out in faith and believe that God has sent us to do this, and we believe that God is going to provide for us. He will every single time. If he calls you to it, he's going to provide for it. 
If he asked you to give everything today, would you give it all? Really? Yes. Joseph, would you join me? Would you give everything? If he asked you to give away your car, would you give it? Actually, I feel like somebody at church today, God's asked you to give your car. And you haven't. I don't know if you only have one car. I don't know what your situation is, but God's asked you to give your car away to somebody. And you haven't. Can he trust you? Can you believe in faith that he's got a provision for you on the other side of it? You know, just this last week, um, actually two weeks ago, um, somebody called and said, Hey, Sheridan, I've got a washer and dryer if you want it. And, um, and I was like, I mean, I'll take it. My washer and dryer is always going out, it feels like. But I'll take it and I'll hold on to it because, you know, somebody's going to need one one day. We'll take it, right? They feel generous. They want to give it away. We'll take it. Last week, Christina, wave your hand, Christina. She's a part of the worship team. She has launched her own uh, salon. And she invited Eli and I to come and pray and bless the salon. And so we did. Can you smile, Demi? <laughs> smile for the camera. No. Um, she asked us to come pray over it And so we're like, you know, give us a tour Like, what are we looking at here? What? Show us your vision, what do you see? And one of the things she said is she sees peace Like, people come in and they're just peace There's just peace in here We began to pray for peace over the salon That as people would come in, they would feel The peace of God in there And she continued to tour us around the salon And show us, like, this is where this is going to be And this is where that's going to be And we walked past this big empty hole just space on the floor and she said and one day that's when my washer and dryer is going to go and Eli looks at me and I looked at him and I honestly I kind of forgot we had and we had just got one and he said I got a washer and dryer for you if you have the face she could see the washer and dryer sitting there and it wasn't even sitting there but she made room for it and God provided for her God provided a week before she even made it known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever it is you're believing for, he wants to provide for it. But you've got to step out in faith. Faith without works is dead. you got to work. you yeah. got to do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jairus, his faith step, he said, if I can get Jesus to come to my home and pray over my daughter, she'll live. Yeah. He was a ruler in the synagogue. He came off his high horse, his high chair, humbled himself, and went to Jesus, found him, brought him back to his daughter, and his daughter lived. The woman with the issue of blood doesn't give her name. But the woman with the issue of blood, she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Her work was to get up underneath that crowd and touch his garment. And she was healed. I say, my faith step. Can you say hi? <laughs> say, my name is. My name is. My name is. <laughs> my faith step was to take some pictures and video footage because one day I was going to show a real life miracle Demi is three years old now look Demi <laughs> Demi is three years old now and you know God calls us to step out in faith she's ready for her daddy you going to be a preacher girl God has big plans for her life he has big plans for her life. He has big plans for your life. He wants to do miracles in your life, but you have to step out. You have to do something that's maybe not ordinary. It doesn't look right. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't calculate. What is it he is calling you to take a faith step out into today? What has he called you to do that you haven't done yet because you just can't make sense of it? I just want to challenge you to think what is going on in your life. If you'll stand with me.